All right, so super excited to have Paul Falcone here for our uh, kickoff workshop of day two, having difficult conversations and giving hard to hear feedback. Just a little bit on uh, Paul. He is a best-selling author and top-rated presenter and storyteller who makes learning fun and exciting no matter how challenging the topic. He specializes in topics such as workplace leadership and talent management, including effective hiring, performance achievement, tough conversations, and workplace ethics. Drawing from his years of experience as head of HR from Nickelodeon, head of international HR for Paramount Pictures, and head of HR operations for NBC's primetime and late night lineups, Paul knows how to entertain and train meaningful concepts for quick and easy adaptation and implementation. He's uh, a presenter who imparts leadership wisdom with practical step-by-step -step actions for immediate mastery and same-day implementation. And he's the author of several books. I highly encourage you to, to check them out. All kinds of really, really important topics on workplace leadership, uh, ethics, um, having difficult conversations, et cetera. And you can learn more about him at paulfalconehr.com. And with that, I will leave it to you, Paul. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everybody. And some of you have already figured out how to use the chat. So hi, Nikki. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Um, this is quite a lineup, and I'm a big fan of everything uh, that Jeremy and Luke are doing. When they first reached out to me and I found out about the Peaceful Leadership Institute, I was like, wow, I want to be part of this. And they said, well, would you like to do a podcast with us? And I did. And then they told me about the inaugural summit. And I thought, you bet I am in because I'm a big fan of everything they're doing. Give me a second, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see my PowerPoint. And what I do is I tend to give a lot of notes on a PowerPoint. At this point, you should be able to see it. Um, in theory, for me, I'd like to give more notes so that A, you don't have to write your hand off, and B, I don't want you to walk away saying, well, it was really good and it sounded great, but I don't remember exactly what he said. Um, so if I err on the side of giving too many notes on a PowerPoint slide, don't mind. That's always been my style. Um, for today, when you think about this idea of, you know, collaborative peace in a workplace culture, what does that mean? Especially when you're dealing with conflict and how do you turn conflict into something that's constructive in, in nature? Um, and how do you make it that, yes, you can still hold people accountable, still be the good guy, but make sure that people are course correcting. Too many times, everyone, like the path of least resistance is avoidance, right? And the managers sweep it under the rug and they look the other way and they hope it fixes itself. And it doesn't. And then some proverbial straw is broken on the camel's back and they come into my office and human resources. And they're like, I want this guy gone. And I'm like, what happened? Well, you should see, I've been putting up with this for a long time, mm -hmm, right? And then you know the story. So, all right, well, let me look at his personnel file. Let's see what the record says. Well, he's been here for five years. All of his performance reviews say he's either meeting expectations or he's stellar. There is no progressive discipline on file. You can't just make the person magically disappear. And you wouldn't want to, even if you could, because that's not the kind of, kind of employer that you really want to be. So that's where we're going to get into. It's, you know, it's what we learned in the third grade. It's not what you say but it's how you say it. But of course, what you say is important too, especially since so much of what we do in the workplace is under this legal lens where we're worried about, you know, stepping on landmines that we don't even see coming our way. So we'll walk through these slides, everyone. Um, if you do have any comments, pop them in the chat. I don't know that I'll answer them right when they come on, um, but I'll try and keep an eye on those as we move forward. And worst comes to us, we can always get to them at the end as well. But feel free to drop those comments in the chat. Um, as far as my background, um, let's see if I can go there. Yeah, Jeremy did a fine job explaining it. You may know me. I've written for HR Magazine for years. I now write for the SHRM HR Daily Newsletter. Um, I've taught at UCLA Extension for years. Um, I speak at the SHRM conference fairly, you know, fairly often. So I I'm kind of well known out there in that sense, which changed for me, everyone. So you know, was after three decades in the HR leadership trenches, I opened my own consulting practice. So I'm independent now as of July. So it's really kind of fun. I'm having a good time. I'm specializing in leadership and management training. That's not too hard to figure out. Um, I'm a certified executive coach and I will do keynote talks and I'm hoping to facilitate corporate offsite retreats because I've always been on the receiving end of those. And I think they're so cool. And I'm like, I want to do that when I grow up. So 
Anyway, I'm part of the gray resignation. You've heard about this. The people who were, you know, baby boomers thinking, well, I could work till I retire or I want to do something a little different. And I'm finally taking the plunge. So I'm enjoying it. I'm three months in and it's kind of exciting. Um, just so you know, I didn't only work in entertainment. I've also worked in healthcare and biotech as well as financial services. I've worked in international nonprofit union environments, you know, pretty much across the board. So I've got a, a pretty good feel for what's going on out there for the most part. I need to put you one second in slide mode. One second. There we go. So now I can go there. Okay. So there he is with that lovely picture. All right. Next. The, the book that we're going to talk from today is the first one. It's 101 Tough Conversations to Have with Employees. Right? It's a manager's guide to performance, conduct, and discipline challenges. It goes hand in hand with the next one, which is the 101 Sample Write-Ups for Documenting Employee Performance Problems. Um, that one came first. The publisher at the time, the American Management Association said, Paul, the book on documentation is doing great, but we need you to write a book on how to hold a conversation while you're giving the document. <laughs> so it turned out to be much broader than that. <clears throat> it's not only about discussions of, you know, when you're writing people up, but it's any type of challenge you can find, performance, conduct, attendance, safety, um, all these kinds of things um, in various formats. Now at the bottom where it says new and 22, one of the things I did, everybody, is I tied the launch of the new consulting firm um, to a book launch. It's called the Paul Falcone Workplace Leadership Series. It consists of five books. I'm really proud of it. And I'll show you it in one second. First of all, here's the books that most people know me for. The bottom right, the one in orange, is 101 Tough Conversations. The one directly above it is 101 Sample Write-Ups. So those are the books that kind of go hand in hand. On the bottom row, you'll also see the 2600 Phrases books. They go hand in hand. One is for effective performance reviews. One is for setting uh, effective performance goals. So you can see the way I write. I tend to like numbers. Give me 101 of this or 96 of that or 2,600 of the other because I don't typically want to read the book from page one to page 240 before I can glean everything. I just need what I need when I need it. So give me a table of contents. Get me to number 72 because this is what's coming up right now. And I want to know how to handle that on the spot. So it's just the way my mind works. People always say, why do you do the, the numbers? And I'm like, it's just the way I compartmentalize things and, and put information, I guess, in my own head. But I use my own books because I need them. I, you know, I have to refresh myself. I write these in the moment, oftentimes turning them into an article. But then every couple of years, I turn those articles into a book. You know, it's that kind of idea. Now, the new book series, which came out a few months ago, is called the Paul Falcone Workplace Leadership Series. They couldn't fit the word workplace at the top because it was too long, um, but it covers the employee life cycle. Again, it starts with ethics because I've taught the ethics class at UCL Extension for years. There's never really been a book on it, but I do think I should write one because in this world today, we need ethics more than ever. So I'm hoping to kind of bring that to light in writing that book. I have a series on effective hiring and onboarding, one specifically for new managers to make them get up to speed as quickly as possible. And then two sister books, Leadership Offense and Leadership Defense, which is basically how to motivate, develop, coach, retain, that's leadership offense, how to have tough conversations, document discipline, structure terminations, blah, 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 you know, that's leadership defense. That's what we're gonna talk about today. So we'll move through this stuff fairly quickly, but I'm, I'm hoping it'll be easy enough to follow. So peaceful resolutions to practical workplace challenges. Um, that's kind of what I'm all about. And I don't do drama, just so you know. I give, I call it value, values-based uh, leadership. When I start with a new company, I give them Paul's top 10. Like my HR team, we call a meeting. I go over my top 10 things that are important to me. Not rocket science. Things like, you know, have one another's back, each to his own without judgment, teach what you choose to learn. You know, I, I, I talk to them about what my philosophy is, but my number 10, the one I say for last, is no drama. I don't do drama. I don't like drama. So I need to make sure that right up front, people understand how to deal with me. Don't step on a landmine because I'm going to tell you what my, my key issues are. And the funny thing is by putting a simple document like that together for your team, you know, handbooks, policy and procedure manuals, collective bargaining agreements, even codes of conduct, not really that critical because that one sheet captures the spirit of everything I'm about and everything I think this organization should be about. And so many times if they can just kind of follow the guidance and the wisdom that's in the one pager, 
All the other stuff is important to know, but it's not critical. But getting out ahead of problems before they start creates a lot of peace and avoids a lot of drama. So today we'll talk about the big four. And these are the ones I came up with for this session because these tend to be the stickiest. Dealing with foul language and insubordination. Stop showing, stopping sexual harassment dead in its tracks. I know we go to sexual harassment training, hostile work environment, quid pro quo, yada, yada. That's all the what. We need to focus on the how. Okay, managers need to know what's expected of them, but they need to know how to make sure that this doesn't like creep into their world. Okay, third example, dealing with prima donna high performers who create toxic work environments. This happens in sales a lot. I make so much money for this branch. Without me, this branch would close. So they can't touch me. Or that concept of, well, you know, my uncle's the CEO. So if anyone has a problem with me, maybe they should talk to him first, right? Or the person who says, I've been here for 30 years and I've got ties older than most of these employees. So they, you know, they, they better not be sense, overly sensitive with me. Toughen up. This is just who I am. Those kinds of problems are not easy to fix, um, but we will do it in an hour. Watch, we're going to do this. So we'll have some fun with it. And the final one, convincing a longer term employee to leave voluntarily when there's no, there are no formal warnings and only stellar performance reviews on file. These are tricky situations, everyone. Remember again, it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. People understand if you care. Maya Angelou, the famous US poet said, people may not remember what you did and people may not remember what you said, but people will always remember how you made them feel. And she's totally correct. I, th that was like the first time I read that. I was like, wow, it is that. It's, it's, they, it's your, your passion, it's your competence, it's your character. That's what makes someone a favorite boss. Right? No one describes their favorite boss in terms of someone who does things. They describe the person in terms of who they are. It's their beingness, right? I go through the class at UCLA and I say to the students, tell me about your favorite boss. And one says, my favorite, you know, Paul, it's funny. She always seemed to challenge me to do things I didn't even think I was ready for yet. And the next student says, well, you know, my favorite boss is probably someone I, I don't know. He just always seemed to have my back. He respected my opinion. He made me feel like I had a seat at the table. I always felt welcome. Um, he made me feel smart, okay? Then the next one. And overall, you keep hearing these stories. And I say, are you describing their beingness or their doingness? <clears throat> and the answer is, well, both. And I say, correct, it is both, but which one is it more? Is it more who they are and their character or is it what they do and their actions? And the answer the students typically come to is, well, it's really who they are and their character, right? And from that beingness, they do certain things. But people don't typically describe their favorite boss in terms of what the boss does. Oh, my boss brought bagels every Friday. And every Friday we got together and had a cup of coffee. That's not how they describe it. Um, and that's not gonna make someone the favorite boss. The problem is in our society, we're all focused on doing all the time. What are you doing to motivate your employee? What are you doing to attract new talent? What are you doing? Those are good questions. I understand that. But there's a, uh, there's a quieter answer. Retention is about beingness. Create the environment where people can motivate themselves. Create the space so that people could find their way and feel like their boss has their back. Simple question, do you feel like you really can do your best work every day? That's a question you need to ask your employees. Do you feel like you can really do your best work every day? If they say, yeah, Paul, I'm hitting on all pistons. They're not going anywhere, not for 15 or 20%. I can tell you that because they're not going to risk leaving your shop to go potentially work for Godzilla, who spits fire and throws chairs. Um, on the other hand, if the answer is, well, no, I'm not. We have constant drama in this department. There's constant interpersonal conflict. I don't trust so-and-so. She doesn't trust me. I know it. It's like, that needs to end. When you talk about peaceful leadership, there's a quietness that goes to it. There's an, 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 an inwardness. Um, we've lost the ability as a society to sit around and sit around a campfire and pass wisdom down from the elders to the younger generation. We don't do it. We're, we're too busy. There's too much going on, too much social media, right? There's all these abstractions. We, 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 we really kind of have to get back to a very simple paradigm of passing wisdom down that communication is necessary. And the final thought I'll give on you to give to you is this: ask sociologists 
who is the loneliest generational cohort on the planet right now? And study after study after study shows it's not the people in the retirement homes. It's Gen Z. It's 25 and under. And the studies are coming in basically saying that this younger generation is basically so hooked on digital that they grow up doing IMs and texts, but they're not talking to people. Ask these kids when you go to the to the to, to buy your groceries. Do you want to go to the line that has the person that you talk to, the clerk who asked you how your day is, or do you want to go to self checkout? Same thing in McDonald's. Do you want to talk to the person at the front, or do you want to just do it yourself on on the kiosk? The answer nine times out of ten is they'd rather just do it on their own. I understand that, but in these tests, they're coming across as exceptionally isolated very lonely and as employers we need to know this is the future of our workforce how do how do we create the right circumstances to help this younger cohort come out of its shell so to speak and become more socially connected so just feel food for consideration everyone as we move forward let me tell you about my rules of engagement and and the reason um i i, I do this is because i can't really tell you how to help hold tough conversations with your employees it's like me telling you how to raise your kids. I, I, I don't know your philosophy of parenting. I don't know how you were parented. And I, you know, I have to be careful. So I have to tell you, well, this is my philosophy of parenting. So please put everything that I say in a contextual framework because I, I can't be exactly a, a fit for everybody. Well, it's the same thing here. Here's who I am in terms of my own rules. Each to his own without judgment. I don't judge. I have the right to observe. I'm okay with the what so, I'm not okay with the so what. The so what is the judgmental piece of it. But I'm gonna use the leverage that I have to say from my vantage point, this is what it looks like from time to time. Let me just share with you from a perception standpoint, how I perceive this, okay? Second thing, what you want for yourself, give to another. A very simple injunctive, you be the average bear. How would you respond if someone talked to you in a certain way? Would you wanna work for you? That's a pretty heavy question that I use in executive coaching, but people look at you and they're like, oh, it's a good question. I mean, sometimes, I don't know, you know, it's hard, but the same question, you know, if the whole company followed your lead, would you be happy with where you took it? These are fundamental questions, everyone, that help drive career introspection, that help people see that you're not out there to get them. You're really there to help them raise their own awareness. And that's where we want to go with these tougher conversations. Number three, change your perspective and you'll change your perception. And I believe that strongly. People need to get out of the weeds. You as the leader need to take them up to the 30,000 foot view so they can see things more clearly, especially today with all the noise going on around us. Then when they go back down into the weeds, they have a fresher perspective. Calm the room. We can be the ones to make sure that they can work with peace of mind, regardless of all the craziness going out in the world. Uh, number four, it's not what you say, but how you say it. We talked about that. Perception is reality until proven otherwise. And we're going to talk about the word perception and the importance of the words perception, perception management. As we move through, I'll show you in the examples. Next, the path of least resistance is avoidance. We know that feelings aren't right or wrong. They just are, right? We know that perceptions aren't right or wrong either. They just are. And holding people accountable for their own perception management is a pragmatic leadership communication strategy. I wanna give examples how to do that. That's the employee who says they're being overly sensitive. I've always been this way. And, you know, sorry, but they need to grow up, right? We need to turn that around in a peaceful way that holds people to the highest standards of accountability. Finally, put others' needs ahead of your own by treating them with dignity and respect and respect the, expect them to respond in kind. It's all about selfless leadership, also known as servant leadership. Robert Greenleaf wrote an essay. He was a university professor, wrote an essay in 1970 called The Servant Leader. You can get it for 10 bucks on Amazon. Not a bad idea. Uh, it's written a little academically in terms of the tone, but the bottom line is those ideas are as critical now as they were back at the time. Okay, again, we're all responsible for our own perception management. Let me share with you what it looks like from my vantage point. Come from observation, not judgment. Now, this one is important. Invoke guilt, not anger. And let me tell you, people, I don't want to confuse this. I don't mean guilt in the sense of making people feel bad about themselves, not that kind of guilt. Guilt is a moral emotion. Um, and what guilt tends to do in its highest sense is help people look inside for partial responsibility, for being part of a solution. 
if I yell at someone in a meeting, I can't believe that you in front of everybody, who do you think you're right? Then they get angry. And with anger, they shut down totally. They assume zero responsibility and they push everything. They deflect everything outward. This is not me, it's you. You can't fix anything when it comes from anger. Guilt is a different uh, trigger. When you sit with someone privately after a meeting and say, Sarah, I'm not sure what happened in there, but how you approached me in front of everybody else on the team, I just have to be honest. I was a little shocked. It really hurt my feelings. I don't have that kind of relationship with you or anyone on the team. And truthfully, I respect you too much to ever speak with you, speak at you like that. So help me understand like what happened in there. Oh, Paul, I'm sorry. That's not what I intended. I didn't mean for it to come out that way. If it did, I'm so sorry. That's what guilt does. It makes people look inside. So if you don't like the word guilt, you don't have to use it. You can use the word awareness. But awareness isn't really a human emotion. When you talk about emotions, guilt is an emotion technically. But I think just juxtapose it from anger and realize that with anger, you get nowhere. <laughs> when, when people can assume partial responsibility for a problem, they will typically assume that responsibility and fix it. And coaching leadership is all about heightened sensitivity and raised awareness when you talk about emotional intelligence, emotional quotient, and whatnot. Now, golden rules of enlightened leadership allow people to assume responsibility or at least partial responsibility for their actions, and you'll pierce their heart and get them to change things because they want to and, and not because they have to, right? Remember this, all motivation is self-motivation. You cannot motivate your team. That is not your responsibility. You can bring in pom-poms, yay, but that's not going to motivate them. Your job is to create the space where they can find a way to motivate themselves. And that's going to be different for each one of your employees. If span of control is typically four to eight people, you can spend time with four to eight people. Um, you're not going to do this with all your extended reports. I get that. But with your direct reports, it's reasonable for you to make the space for them to talk about what their needs are, what their goals are, what, what they hope the company can help them with. If you don't make the space, you don't make the space. A lot of companies don't. I think it's silly. When we look at Gen Y and Gen Z, these are the most studied generational cohorts in history. We know what they want. And they basically want five things. Career and professional development comes in on that top five scale in study after study after study. Okay, yeah, they want corporate um, social responsibility. They want environmentalism. They want work-life balance. Uh, they want diversity of thoughts, ideas, and voices, i.e. people. We know the things they want, but career and professional development comes in right at the top, especially after COVID. In COVID, most of us have been treading water career-wise for two to three years now. There's not been a lot of opportunity to learn new stuff, um, right? Now's the time to rebuild. Now's the time to re-strengthen that muscle. It's time to reward these people for everything they've done for the last three years. Figure out how to make that gift come to your people. It's a perfect time to do it. Finally, treat adults like adults without drama. And they'll typically rise to the occasion. So I'm going to start with one, everyone. Um, okay, I mean, there's, I know some questions came in. Hang on one second. Paul, I'm not familiar with the what's so phrasing. Can you please clarify? Yeah, it's fine. It's just an expression. So the so what element tends to be more judgmental. It, 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 it's inferring something. What so? Simply what, what so? That's the observation, okay? So you can forget what so versus so what if you don't like it. You don't have to use that. But the, but the point is, use your right and your authority as a leader to observe and share what the observation looks like from your vantage point. Basically, you have the right to talk about the perception because perception, remember, is not right or wrong. It just is. That's where you want to come from. As soon as it comes from the, what were you thinking? Are you serious? Um, I don't know why you would think that it was okay to, as soon as you get into that mode, you're in the, you're, you're judging them. You're basically saying, you know, were you not thinking? Where are you coming from? Blah, 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 blah. People get defensive. It triggers anger. I don't want to trigger anger. That's not the goal of what I'm doing. So it's a great question. And thank you for the clarification there. You're working, Jess. You're welcome, Jess. Good, cool. All right. So next, speaking off the record, real quick, just warm up exercise. Someone comes up to you and says, hey, boss, you got a minute. I need to talk to you off the record. What's your answer? Sure, what's going on? Step into my office. Wrong, don't ever do that again. Make sure your managers understand this. You've got to qualify any requests to speak confidentially before the person's, uh, person opens his or her mouth. 
Example, I work for a company, manager of IT is walking down the hallway. One of the programmers says, can I talk to you confidentially for just a minute? Manager says, sure, what's up? Reaches in his pocket, pulls out a bullet, a bullet, and says, nobody better bother me today. That's all I'm telling you. Puts the bullet back in his pocket and goes back to working on his computer. Manager is freaked out, of course, because this person is known to be a shooter. He carries the rifles in the back of his car, goes to the range every night, is not allowed to drive his car onto the campus because it has weapons. But that veiled threat really scared this manager who came to me in human resources. The bottom line is we had to fire that employee. I had to fire that employee because it was a veiled threat. But the truth of the matter is don't just automatically say, sure, what's up? Okay, qualify it. What I usually teach managers to do is just say, well, I can talk to you, but if it has to do with one of three things, I can't keep it a confidential. If it has to do with number one, discrimination or harassment, number two, potential violence in the workplace, or number three, some kind of conflict with the organization's interests, I've got an affirmative obligation to disclose that. I cannot sit on it. So keeping that in mind, do you still want to talk with me? If the person says, well, yeah, I just kind of want to raise, that's fine. Come on in and we'll talk confidentially. But don't promise confidentiality. That manager at that company promised confidentiality with a guy threatening him with a bullet. And then he comes to human resources and now he's got a tattletale on him and he's pretty nervous. Like I told this guy I wasn't going to say anything, Paul, so I don't know what to do. I sent him home. I said, I want you off the campus. I'll talk to the employee. I'll handle it. And we did it that way. And I made sure my boss was in the loop. I sent the employee home on an administrative leave with pay. My boss and I both called outside counsel. We made sure that we were on strong enough ground to make this termination stick. And we decided that was going to be what it was. And I called that employee by four or five o'clock that afternoon at home. And I said, I'm sorry, but the situation, the record that you created put us in such a, a, a bad situation, we have no choice. And no company is going to have a choice in a situation like this. You can't appear to threaten people with a bullet especially when they know you've got rifles in the back of your car. If you came in the next day, you or anybody else, I'm not saying you, but if someone came in the next day after making that kind of threat and then pulled out a gun and did damage to the organization, we knew that there could have been a problem. They're going to say we didn't do anything about it. So it forces us. We don't have the discretion. I like you. You know I do, and I'll help you. If you need help with your resume, your unemployment, if you need help with your COBRA, I'm here for you. Don't worry about that. But the reality is you've left us no choice. I'm really sorry. But there has to be a healing moment at the time of the termination. That's how people can move on when they're in their lives. A lot of times employers get so nervous at the termination meeting. I, I had someone who, when I was learning employee relations early in my career, and I would sit in and watch this person, the way she handled every one of these terminations. It was a sales organization. So There's a lot of terminations for sales performance. And the way the person ended each meeting was, and oh, by the way, if you're planning on suing is good luck because we've got the best outside counsel in Los Angeles. Didn't make any sense to me. Why kick a dog while they're down? These people getting fired is about the most vulnerable you can be in your life. You don't need an employer that's you know sticking prongs in you at the time. Have a heart. Be there for people when they need you. And to me, my comfort zone has always been, I'll help you with your resume. I'll help you with your unemployment. I'll help you with your um, COBRA. If you just, I'm here to help you, but just understand we have no choice. The record that you inadvertently created just left us no choice. And people can heal from that and they can move on. And I don't want them to leave this company mad and angry. And they've been here for three years and they're going to walk out and hate the organization. I don't want that experience for them or anyone else. Okay, but I'll have an obligation to disclose or an affirmative obligation to disclose if it's one of those things. Are you sure you still want to talk to me? All right, now let's talk about foul language. We'll get into the fun stuff. First thing was, here's your scenario. Um, I was working in the creative space. There was an animator who was from Ireland. He was very, very funny, very strong Irish brogue. But every third word happened to be an F-bomb. Finally, someone came forward to the line producer, who's like the business manager for that, for that production, and says, I'm getting tired of it. It's really getting offensive. It's not funny anymore. I'm not the only one who feels this way, but I'm the only one willing to come forward. Um, but it really needs to stop. Fine. Line producer comes to me. He's head of HR and says, what do we do? And I said, what do you want to do? 
She said, I don't know. That's why I'm here. And I said, I know you don't know, but if you did know, what would you want to do? And she said, you know, Paul, you always ask these questions. Okay, what I want to do is I just want to stop the behavior. He's a good guy. We all like him. He's an excellent animator. We don't want to lose him. But the reality is he does have to stop. Okay, I said, let's call him in. You just give the opening as to what the problem is and then hand it over to me, okay? So basically she said, whatever his name was, Jim, we, you know, we're bringing you in here. First he walks in and he sees his boss with HR. That's not a good feeling. So he's like, okay, something's wrong. Um, and, you know, the boss says, Paul, I, I, uh, Paul I, I asked you to meet with us because there's an issue that you're aware of, that I'm aware of, that I'd like you to bring to Jim's attention. So I said, Jim, we've been put on notice that there's too many F-bombs flying uh, from your desk. And we love you, you know that. But the bottom line is we really need you to take those out of your vocabulary because it's going to create a problem for you. It's going to create a problem for us. Can we do it? Will you, will you support us in that? And he looked at me and he said something that didn't include the F-bomb, but did include another choice word. And basically he said, I'm so busy. I can't believe that you have the nerve to call me into HR for something like this. You need to understand this word is part of who I am. My mother used it. My father used it. My brothers and sisters used it. My friends used it. We all use it. It is just part of our vocabulary. These people need to lighten up and they need to grow a little skin, I think, thick, thick skin or something along those lines. This is where the, the conversation picks up. Jim, you're not hearing me. You're going on the offensive right now when you need to be playing defense, okay? This isn't about you any longer. Um, it's about your coworkers and it's about our company. When someone puts us on notice that they're no longer comfortable with the curses, the loose banter, the jokes, the F-bombs, and they arguably become what's known as pervasive in the workplace, there's your big words, then in the eyes of the law, the whole company is deemed to be placed on notice. At that point, we no longer have the discretion to laugh it off and ignore it. We've got to address it. And that's where we are right now. In fact, if we do ignore it, we could have what they call a hostile work environment situation on our hands. And I know you know that from the training. So I'm not going down that road, but basically hostile environment claim, hostile work environment claims are a subset of sexual harassment, which in turn falls under the company's anti-discrimination policy, yada, yada, yada. In short, we're putting you on notice that the language has to stop immediately thoughts. I don't know if I could do it. That was not a good Irish accent I just did, but I'm trying. Okay. I'm trying to get you in the mode. Jim, look, I'll be honest. If you really feel like you cannot, or you will not accommodate our request, you may have to make an employment decision. Um, I don't want to be in a situation to terminate you. Okay. And you don't want to have a record that says you were terminated from this shop because we are pretty much the hottest shop in Hollywood. It just isn't gonna be good for you. And it would be very hard to explain to a prospective employer. If you won't agree to this at this point, you'll either have to resign or realize that you'll probably be terminated for cause if this happens again. And based on what you're telling me right now, I'm probably gonna to have to put this in the format of a final written warning so that if you violate the terms of the final written warning, you're in essence terminating yourself. It's hard to hear, okay? And the best he could do in that moment was he could say, I need to think about this and sleep on it. I'm okay with that. It's fine. No F-bombs between now and when you sleep on it. Agreed. He said, yeah, I got it. Okay. Now, let me tell you where the conversation can twist. Either when you're talking about this idea of foul language and F-bombs, or you're talking about sexual harassing behavior. Oh, the executive producer of the show is hitting on the interns and taking the interns to lunch and dinner, whatever it happens to be. You need to have some tools in your, in your vocabulary to kind of move the conversation forward. So I continued with Jim this way. Jim, look, there's one more thing, and I'm not saying this is scaring you. It's just that I want you to be fully educated on the matter. If the company were to be sued, you would also be named as an individual defendant in the lawsuit. And it's scary to see your name in a lawsuit. In fact, in extreme cases where the company warns the employee and the employee still refuses to change his or her ways, then the employee may be considered to be acting outside the course and scope of his employment. And that's where it gets really wonky. You know, all those trainings you go to and you sign off that you went to the trainings and all those policies you signed at the beginning of the season saying you recognize that you will respect and abide them. That's all evidence, Jim, that you aren't doing what we told you. We are the good corporate citizen and you are the errant employee who refuses to commit 
uh, or refuses to hold to your own commitments, that's not a good record for you. Under those circumstances, the company's legal team wouldn't necessarily protect you. In short, you could be on your own to find your own lawyer, pay the lawyer fees, 600 bucks an hour, and then pay the damages that arise from the claim. We don't pay you enough money to risk your home and your bank account for work-related lawsuits. So anytime you find yourself slipping back into your old ways, be sure and stop by my office so that I can remind you about the risks you're assuming when it comes to foul language in the workplace or dating interns or whatever it happens to be. And last thought, but I need you to understand this here. In many states, Jim, supervisors can be held personally liable for up to $50,000 of their own money for what they call acting outside the course and scope of their employment or managerial bad acts. Okay, $50,000, but not so in California. In California, there's no limit. Now I just let that bake in because they didn't know that. No one seems to know that. <laughs> they need to know that. If you're not in California, you need that $50,000 rule. Check with your council, make sure that applies in your state. It's probably similar in almost all states. But in California, as soon as they hear there's no limit, they're like, what? And then the answer, they look down at their shoes and they're like, well, I didn't know that. How come no one's ever told me that before? And my answer is I wouldn't be doing your service as my client if I didn't inform you of a landmine like this. The last thing I'd want to see you face is being on the sharp end of the investigation spear, wondering how it got to this point and how it all happened. Look, Jim, I'm not an attorney. Check with your lawyer about this, but do it ASAP. We got ahead of this one, which is great, but I really would like to think that this is one of the most important discussions you'll have all year because it raises your awareness about the risks involved with this stuff. Give some thought to what you might want to change and know that I'm here for you anytime you need me. That, again, I'm on your side. I've got your back, but you've got to play your, your end of the bargain. You've got to hold it up because the reality is if you keep going down this road, all of these things can happen to you and happen to us. And it took him about 72 hours. 72 days, you know, three days later, he put time on my calendar. Hmm. And he said, I apologize. I'm sorry. I've thought about it. You're right. I've looked it up. I actually spoke to my lawyer. Not that I doubted you. I don't ever want to go down that road. I will never use the F-bomb again while I'm in this organization. Nice. Not a lot of drama. Very peaceful, as a matter of fact. But they need to understand that. Now, let's do another example. In an example where you've got the, remember we talked about the prima donna high flyers, right? I, I'm the top sales producer or my uncle's the CFO or, you know, um, I've been here for 30 years and I hired everybody in this company. So they have to, you know, you know, get used to me if they're not used to me. All of that noise is silly. And when that entitlement and mentality creeps in, you want to get that back on an even playing field. There's no judgment here. I'm just trying to coach them and motivate them and mentor them and do all the things they want when they say career and professional development. It's not only about a carrot. It's also about a stick. At times, you have to have both leadership offense and leadership defense. You can't motivate people sometimes to stop using the F-bomb. It's not a motivational conversation. They need to understand what their limits are. So the thing to keep in mind, everyone, is that performance infractions and conduct violations are typically not treated the same in the workplace. Your operational managers usually don't know that. You have a lot more discretion to escalate the process when a conduct issue is at hand. So let me give an example. When it comes to theft or embezzlement, fraud, forgery, those are what we call a summary offense or summary termination. You don't get progressive discipline for that. You stole from the company, you're fired. You remember the song, Teach Your Children Well? You need to make sure that your, your newly minted high school graduate employees, college graduate employees, understand that time card fraud is theft. You engage in time card fraud, it's the same as stealing money. The company is going to terminate you for that. That is not subject to progressive discipline. We need to sit around the campfire and we need to pass the wisdom down to the younger generations proactively so that they don't step on these landmines, okay? But the idea is when you look at this, I say the best things in life you can really explain on the back of a napkin or in the back of an envelope. And you simply draw a circle. It's called the performance conduct circle. And you put performance in the top or co and conduct in the bottom. And if you don't like the word conduct, you put the word behavior in the bottom. It's the same thing. Okay. And basically what you're telling someone is you're responsible for the full circle. Um, quick chat question. Let me just see something. Could also offer EAP as they provide tools to help you learn how to control these types of outbursts and gain self-control. Susan, 
totally 100% agree. EAPs are great for that. If your company does not have an employee assistance uh, program, it is definitely worth looking into. They're not particularly expensive. They give wonderful resources to employees to reach out to them confidentially and to get the help they need for whatever it happens to be. Sometimes they need financial help. Sometimes they need legal help. Sometimes there's an alcohol or drug problem in the family. EAPs are wonderful. And if your organization does not have one, I'd highly recommend you look into that. Okay, but back of an envelope, performance versus conduct. Here's what the conversation sounds like. Okay, this is what the top sales producer. Um, Maggie, you're excelling well beyond expectations in the top half of the circle. You knock it out of the park, which is great. But I have to share some constructive feedback with you that might be a little bit difficult to hear, but I want you to hear it for me so you understand where I'm coming from. On the bottom half of the circle, you're basically failing. And I, just, just stay with me. Let me, let me, let me kind of hash this out. You're not serving as a role model in terms of your behavior and conduct. You're not making yourself a resource to your peers. I don't see you trying to build people. Basically, people are afraid of you. And when people describe you, either directly to me or I've overheard it, they use words like toxic, abrasive, confrontational, uh, condescending. As a result, you're only meeting half the expectations of your role. Because no matter how strong you are in the top half of that circle, you're responsible just like I am for the full circle. So you're knocking it out of the park on the top half, but you're not meeting expectations on the bottom half. That means that overall, Maggie, it's not working. This is not tenable. I have some thoughts though. Um, right now, our branch performance is only as good as you can produce individually. You consistently bring in 80% of our branch revenue. It's great. But from a career and professional development standpoint, remember those are the words that the Gen Y and the Gen Z want. From a career and professional development standpoint, I want you to consider thinking much bigger. Um, to move from top sales producer to regional sales manager or general sales manager status, you've got to develop a longer term career vision for yourself. I've got your back. I can help you do that. We can fix it right here and right now. But I really need you to sleep on this because it's only going to occur if you become as strong in the bottom half of the circle as you are on the top. If you can begin the role model, if you can become the role model in both quadrants, so to speak, sky's your limit. You've got potential to do so much. So my ultimate question is, how can I help you become a role model leader and remain a top producer? How can I help you take it to the next level career-wise? Now, toxic sales producers aren't the only ones. You'll have toxic managers, you'll have toxic employees. I have seen my own experience, the longer they're with the organization, especially when you're talking decades, sometimes that entitlement syndrome kicks up, right? It kicks in. There's the victim mentality. There's the everyone, you know, except me, you know, those kinds of things. You need to coach them through that. I'm not saying go straight to discipline, but most managers sweep it under the rug. And that's not fair to these employees, especially the ones who have been there for decades. They deserve more than that, my humble opinion. And I'll be the one to give it to them, but I'm going to call them on this stuff because I think it's really important. What I don't have in this slide deck is another sentence. If you want to write one thing down is this, the most important decisions about your career are made when you're not in the room. And that's what I put in here. And I forgot it on this particular presentation. The most important decisions about your career are made when you're not in the room. That's for you, for me, and for everybody else. How can I help you influence what's being said about you when you're not there to hear it? Let me help you with that. I'll be the one who has your back. I want to be that coach and mentor to you, but only if you'll allow me. You don't have to give me an answer right now. I want you to sleep on this and come back to me this week and tell me what your thoughts are. But if people haven't been talking to you about these issues, Maggie, they, they've been sweeping out on the rug and they're not, doing, they're not doing any justice to you. The truth of the matter is you need to be excelling in both quadrants. And if you can build that bottom half of the circle like you do the top half of the circle, I will be amazed to see where your career goes. Um, but the truth of the matter is if you keep getting adjectives <laughs> like toxic and confrontational and condescending, you really won't be able to progress any further than you're progressing. And I'm just being honest with you. So again, there's no judgment here. This is just my observation, but I'm willing to help you if you want me to be the one to help you do that. 
Okay, that's where these conversations need to go. They need to see that it's in their own best interests to partner with you, to finally overcome the things that they know they've been getting away with. People aren't stupid, but the bottom line is they're bullies and they push and they push and they push proactively, right? They go on offense when they should be playing defense. And I'm going to be the one to call them on that. I'm going to say, wait a second, you're playing offense right here. This is not about you going on offense. I'm on offense. You're on defense. You understand? I need to have that kind of conversation sometimes. I really need to reset their heads on their shoulders. The truth of the matter is if Maggie partners with me on this, I'm happy as a clam. If she chooses not to, I'm also okay with that. I'm also happy as a clam. This happens one more time, we move to a write-up. And the date that we had this conversation and all of this talk is going to be the first paragraph. On this date, I met with you. I extended an olive branch. I explained to you that I was willing to be your coach and your mentor to help you with this. We talked about the important, the most important decisions about your career being made when you're not in the room and my willingness to help you strengthen your reputation and your conduct and behavior to match your stellar performance. But this is not about your job performance. This is about the conduct and it continues to be a problem. For example, yesterday, blah, 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 blah. So I'm not afraid to lose a, a, a biller who brings in 80% of the revenue for the branch. Got to start over again. The problem with a prima donna sales producer, is you're never going to get more than this person brings in because she eats her young, right? You get total turnover. Everyone leaves all the time because they can't work with her. So I can't grow the branch. I, I, for me, I'm better off just taking the loss and starting over again. That's how I look at it. And I'm not afraid to close a branch either. But my point is, you can't be held hostage by these people. That's not fair to you. And it's certainly not fair to the other members of the team. Okay, good. Next, incentivizing longer term employees to leave when there's no corrective action on file. This one ain't easy. This is where the, uh, the proverbial straw is broken on the camel's back. I want this guy gone today. Mm. No progressive discipline, only positive performance reviews, right? And now I'm HR, I'm the bad guy. I'm standing in the way of you getting what you want. That's why everyone, so you know, if you're in HR, what I tend to do is when I go into a new organization, the first thing I do is management training. I want all the managers on the same page in terms of understanding who I am, how I do things. And I specifically tell them, don't come to me with this fact pattern because it's not going to work. You didn't do your job. If you come to me, now, if it's a summary offense because it's theft or embezzlement or fraud, yeah, we get to terminate. But those are egregious misconduct. You don't just arbitrarily terminate someone at whim for performance-related reasons. Performance, the expectation is you're going to go through steps of progressive discipline, right? It's Americana, three strikes before you're out. You don't just say, out you go. Same thing for attendance. You have to go through steps. With conduct, you don't necessarily have to. You can terminate for a first offense, or you can move straight from zero to a final written warning for a first offense. Conduct gives you a lot more discretion. Your managers think everything has to be handled with steps one, two, and three. It doesn't. And when I see bad behaviors and I say, let me share with you what I saw. And they're like, yeah, but Paul, you don't know what it's like having to work with him. I don't want to go through. I got to get, what am I getting? A documented verbal warning. He's such a pain in the neck. It's going to make it worse. And I say, but what I saw, that wasn't a verbal warning. That was a final written warning. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, you've got more discretion when it comes to, 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 you know, conduct related stuff. Don't you know that? No, I thought everything had to start with a verbal. All right, this is a mindset that exists out there. We need to break that chain. Okay, with longer term employees, the situation is you need a third party arbiter. It cannot be you, the supervisor, doing this with your employee. That can very easily be interpreted as a constructive discharge claim. Okay, wrongful termination means the, the, the company fired the person. Constructive discharge means the person quit but any reasonable person would have quit under those circumstances, so the damages are basically the same. Constructive discharges, well, you know, Your Honor, they basically told me if I didn't leave, they were going to fire me, so I had to leave. Yeah, yeah, that's constructive discharge, right? So you, you have to have someone who's objective, someone who's above the fray. If you don't have an HR department, if the problem is between a director and a member of the staff, have a VP or a senior VP or the president or the business owner be the arbiter. If you have an HR person, have the HR person be the arbiter, but it needs to be someone who's beyond the immediate action. It needs to be someone who's objective. Here's how I've said it in, in the past. It appears that you may not be all that happy in this role, and I suspect that your supervisor, supervisor may not be that happy either. Is that fair to say? Probably. All right. 
one of the options would be, look, the supervisor isn't going anywhere. She's been here for 10 years. She's doing well in her job. I just have to be honest with you. It's not going to be a showdown. Is it you, the assistant or the VP that's going to be the one? The VP is here. And I know for the last year, you've had a problem. You've had some challenges. I know she's had, both of you have come to see me, full disclosure, in the frustration. One of the options is you could begin the progressive disciplinary process, which can, which can ultimately result in a termination for cause, which is something I know you wouldn't want on your record after so many years with the company or after you put in such a hard year with us. I know that's not a fun option. Um, you know, in this case, it's a longer term employee. So let me, let me rephrase that. Let's assume the person's been here for 10 years plus. But I want to be sure you feel like you have options. I, I don't want you to feel like a duck in a barrel. That's not fair. You've been here for 10 years. We respect that. One of the things I will tell you is if you choose to stay and work this out, then that's certainly an option for you. And I will support you. We will support you in any way we can. It's really, really important that you understand that. Okay. I'm not telling you, you have to leave. But you really have to think about, do you want to do this? Because there is a risk that you could go down that path of termination. Okay, just in fairness. The second thing is, sometimes employees want to schedule a timeline where they, they, they want to continue working, they want to remain employed, but they want to do a job search. This way, they don't have to come up with, oh, my garage door broke, oh, my car broke, oh, my dog ran away. That's drama. We don't need it. I'd rather be much more transparent. If you want to find a job, do it quietly on your own. The only thing we'd ask is you give us like 24 hours notice so that we know what's going on. But you keep that confidential between you and your boss and we can make that happen, okay? The only the other thing is I would say you have to put a reasonable time frame on this. Can't go on forever. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll give myself 90 days, but at the end of 90 days, if I don't find anything that I'm going to resign or 120 days, whatever you think is appropriate, we'd, we'd agree on that on the front end. Okay, the third option is if you prefer to leave the company right now because you have had it, life is too short, I don't want to do this for another day without, you know, because I understand that happens too. I think the best way to do it was number one, we won't contest your unemployment. So you definitely can get unemployment. Well, it's up to you to get unemployment. The unemployment department determines it, but we won't contest it. We won't challenge it. We respect your decision to leave on your own terms. We'll work with you to craft a message that we're both comfortable with, but I want you to control the narrative. I just don't want you to feel like you have no options or you're, you're heading down this irreversible path. You're not. Life is too short for that. And I'd like to think we all respect each other enough to recognize that, oh, sometimes it's not a fit, but we're adults. We can figure this out. But the options are important to me. And that's what I want to I want to kind of share with you. So sleep on it. I'm here. Please come see me later in the week. Tell me what you're thinking. Um, but let me know how I can be an ally through this. Because it's no fun to do this, number one, in general. But it's certainly no fun to do it when you're alone. Yes, I'm human resources. I represent both the company and the employees. But in this case, I'll kind of shave a little bit more towards you because I want you to feel like you've got someone who's got your back through all this. Those kinds of discussions make a big difference in people's lives. A lot of times they honestly do. Oh, someone said great presentation. Thank you. That's nice. Um, the, the, the fairness of it, the, the sense of I'm not alone. I'm not isolated. I have no choices here or I do have choices here calms the room. It kind of creates that space where people can be human again. And I think that's important. Now, the only thing that's not on the slide, and I'm going to share with you one more thing is normally before I do a presentation like this one-on-one -on -one with someone, I speak with the supervisor and with the division head, department head, and say, do you guys want to give a package? Do you want me to offer a package? I will basically tell them, look, I can't promise anything, but if you'd like me to think about, if you'd like me to ask about it, I can. And let's assume they say, yeah, Paul, we can give her th three months. Give her, we'll give her a three-month package in exchange for a release if we'd rather her go. Fine. So where I'm adding to number three is a number four. And in the number four, you know what I would say. I'd say Sarah, look, I can't promise you anything, but I'm going to throw another thought out there. If you think it would help if you got some kind of a separation package, um, I could ask. I can't, No, technically, I already got the approval for it, but she doesn't know that. I can ask. And if it's something that you think that would help, I don't know, you tell me, you want a month? Do you want two months? Do you want three months? Whatever, I don't know, but it doesn't hurt to ask if you want to. And then sleep on it and come to me, make that another option, but that's a shadow option because I don't have a guarantee on that, but we could always try, it's not gonna hurt. By doing it that way, 
the chances of constructive discharge claim, very, very small, because the first point I made was, you're welcome here. We'll make it work if you want to make it work, but we do have to have these changes in either performance or conduct. By going down this path of either, you know, you can look openly for the next 90 days, or if you want to package now, we'll let you manage the, you manage the narrative. All of that stuff treats people with dignity and respect, which is something especially needed when they're going through something like this. It is just not a fun thing to do. So we want to make sure we're there for them. Okay. Now, almost done. Bonus, stopping attitude problems. Okay, when it comes to attitude problems, everyone, do not say attitude. Get that, get that word out of your vocabulary. Do not document that someone has an attitude problem. Courts have thrown those, those, those uh, disciplinary records out. They basically said attitude is a difference in opinion. It's a difference in style. It's not a legitimate way to terminate or discipline or terminate someone. Replace the word attitude with the word conduct or the word behavior. That's okay, but don't use the word ad attitude. Number rule one, tell the person in private how their actions made you feel, like that example before. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to say, John, I don't know what happened in that meeting, but it really kind of hurt my feelings. I was kind of, I was kind of shocked. I mean, I wouldn't do that to you. I respect you too much. I respect your position too much to, to do something like that. I, I guess I'm not sure why you felt it was okay to talk to me that way in front of everybody else on the team. Again, get them to look inside. Rule three, be specific and paint a picture with words. You know, you, you, you stood up, you banged your hand down, you, you, you put your hands on your hip, you cocked your head, and you said, this is BS. You use the word in front of everyone, and you know I'm not someone who uses that kind of language. And you started with the always and the never stuff. This company always does, this company never does it. First of all, whenever you're in always and never mode, you're wrong, just so you know. Let me give you a little feedback. First of all, it's totally exaggerated. No one always does something or never does something, and no company always does something or never does something. So you didn't temper it with sometimes, because sometimes, yeah, people do things and sometimes companies do things, but always and never, them, them be fighting words. That's not going to get you very far. You lost credibility as soon as you stood up, to be honest. And then to, to say that in front of the rest of the team, it was so disrespectful and challenging to me. I, I, I just, I'm not, I, I need help. I need help understanding what happened in there. Okay, normally presenting it like that, most people will be like, oh, Paul, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, fine. Going back to the attitude problem, Lisa, I need your help. You know, they say that perception is reality until proven otherwise. I feel like you're either angry with me or with the rest of the group. And I may be off of my assumption, but that's an honest assessment of the perception you're creating from time to time. See, not always from time to time. I just want you to know that I wouldn't treat you that way in front of other, people's, I, I, other people. I have too much respect for you to do that. Let me ask you, Lisa, how would you feel if you were the supervisor and one of your staff members responded that way in front of the rest of the team? Or how would it make you feel if I responded to your questions with that kind of tone of voice or body language? Would you feel that's appropriate? Is that the right thing for me to do as the department head? You can see where these conversations are going to go. And we're leading them to the water. People will drink in those situations because they realize they went too far. Okay, again, here, oh, it's here. They say the most important decisions about your career are made when you're not in the room. I'd like to help you influence what's being said in the room going forward. If you'll allow me to partner with you and become your coach and your mentor, we can solve this together. I'll have your back, but it's up to you. Okay, so you see the concept, everyone. I knew I had this slide somewhere. Put yourself in partnership with them, even when they're angry, even when they're vulnerable. Um, you can turn around lives. The, the, the greatest gift the workplace offers is leadership because you get to touch people's lives. You get to help them grow and develop. You don't get that as an individual contributor. It's great to be an individual contributor. There's nothing wrong with it. But when you, you know, Marshall Goldsmith's book it was titled, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. <laughs> it's a great title. I wish I thought of that. Um, but the reality is it's, it's a new paradigm. Your success is measured by the success of your people, right? The greatest leaders aren't the ones with the most followers. They're the ones who create the greatest leaders in turn or the greatest number of leaders in turn. Think of it that way. Change your perspective. You will change your perception, right? The, the challenges are still there, but you'll see it differently. Um, final example in the last, cause I, I have about 10 more minutes. 
Uh, and I want to save the time for Q&A, but one more example. This is important. There's an employee who is the mailroom person who moves the cart back and forth and delivers the mail. At this particular company, the gentleman was particularly short and had very, very thick glasses. I don't think he did anything intentionally, but enough women had come to me to complain that he's staring at their breasts and they can't take it anymore. This has been going on for years. It's got to end. He's got to go, blah, 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 blah. So I called in his boss and I said, Linda, tell me what's going on with Bill. She said, Paul, it's true. He has had this complaint since well before you got here. I don't think he's doing it on purpose. I just don't think he can see. And he just looks straight across whoever he's talking to, which puts him at chest level for most people. All right, so we call Bill in, Linda and I, and he looks and he's thinking, uh oh, I'm gonna be fired. And I said, Bill, you're not in trouble, but we need your help with something. Can you come and sit with us? I explained the nature of the complaints. And I said, Bill, there's a difference between perception and reality. Reality is what you know to be true or what you do purposely. Perception is what other people see, regardless of your intentions. But as the rule goes, goes perception is reality until proven otherwise. And perception is in the eyes of the beholder. So even if you don't realize it, you may be creating a perception that's offending other people. From this point forward, Bill, I want you to think of it this way. You have to hold, a, hold yourself accountable for your own perception management. You know, they used to call them PR firms, right? Public relations firms. Now they call them perception management firms. It's the same type of thing, right? The perception is the reality until proven otherwise. So in other words, you have to become sensitive to how you're coming across to other people. When you speak with someone else, especially a woman, make sure you look at them eye to eye, even if they're much taller than you and you have to crane your neck to look at them, look in their eyes, nowhere else. Likewise, don't stare at anyone's chests under any circumstances, men or women, so that no one can accuse you of inappropriate behavior. Does that make sense? Yes. Finally, but like I said, I have no reason to doubt your sincerity. You're not in trouble, but I also have to take other people's complaints seriously. So as a result, I need a commitment from you right now that you'll be very conscious of the perception you're creating at all times, and more importantly, that after today, we'll never have to have a conversation like this again. Agreed? Yes. Okay, thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. Come and see me if you ever have any questions so I can help you with anything. Boom, end of the meeting. And the problem, I think, got better. I mean, you know, it takes time to relearn how to do some of these things. I understand that. But the management realized that we took a good, healthy step there. And, you know, one meeting with the shrink, Paul Falcone, going to fix everything. But the bottom line is people said, we can see he's trying. We can see he's aware of it now. And that's about as good as life is going to get sometimes. A um, few final tips. Don't ever rush to judgment. You're better off placing an individual on a paid investigatory leave when you need additional time to reach a conclusion. Remember the example that I gave you of the IT person who threatened his boss with a bullet and said, no one better bother me today. Okay. I needed to get him off the campus immediately. So I sent him home, administrative leave. I had sent the boss home too, because the boss was freaked out. But the reality was I needed time to talk to my boss and I needed time for us to call our outside counsel. I gave myself the whole afternoon to do that. By the time I called the employee and I terminated the employee over the phone and also told him you cannot have access to campus again without getting my express permission. I'm gonna send you a letter, it's gonna be in writing, but the company has to do this because of the record that was created. Do you understand why I'm doing this? He said, yeah, I get it. Okay, fine. But I bought myself that extra time. Companies too often move to termination before the record is really ready to support that. And that becomes a problem. Final bullet, don't manage by fear of a lawsuit. Instead, make sure that if one comes your way, you're getting sued on your terms and not theirs. There's a big difference there, everybody. You will get analysis paralysis. You'll be like the, the, the deer locked in the headlights if you're always afraid of getting sued. Getting sued is the price of doing business in corporate America. It's going to happen. But I want to make sure if I get sued, it's on my terms, right? I don't want it to be that there's no discipline, there's only positive performance reviews, and the company fired a guy for performance. That is not a record that's sustainable in litigation. I'm going to get killed. We're going to have to settle outside of court because we have no defense. We couldn't think of putting this in front of a jury. You know, it's that kind of thing. Those are really expensive when you have to settle outside of court because you have no defense. So sometimes when the manager pushes and says, I want this guy gone, it's like, slow down. The record isn't there yet. It's all about the record. I'll help you create the record, but we need to set it up and we need to do it now. 
Always focus on shifting responsibility for improvement away from the organization back to the employee where it rightfully belongs. And the final bullet says successful verbal interventions allow you to handle matters respectfully, responsibly, and in a timely manner, which are the key tenets of workplace due process and, and fairness. So I have enjoyed this presentation tremendously. Um, I know we're going to do some q and I'll take a look at the chat. Um, my contact information is here, everyone, and the LinkedIn is in yellow highlight because I love LinkedIn. So if any of you want to send me an invite, I would love to uh, follow up on that. Um, I am going to take a second. Jeremy, let me look at the chat and see what's come in. We talked about Susan. Uh, we talked about Debbie Condescente saying, great presentation. Thank you, Debbie. I uh, love the EAP. Jess, we talked about the, uh, oh, the expression of what so versus so what, and got that. And then, uh, Jeremy, I thought that was a term that covers all genders for someone who is full of themselves. No, I've heard it used for men. I don't remember what that was. Uh, Emily well, had written, it's concerning to see bullet two of stopping sexual harassment and then using a gendered language like prima donna and bullet three. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. I don't know what else I would call it. Emily, if, uh, uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point. Maybe I won't use that, uh, prima donna anymore. Good point, Emily. Okay. And Yvette says, um, oh, yeah, good. Okay. I think I answered all the questions that are there for the most part. Um, Jeremy, yeah. any other questions that you see coming in on your side? Thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, I, well, I had a question. Uh, and, and thanks for the presentation. There's a lot of great examples. There. I mean, th those are like, you know, we do trainings on difficult conversations. Those are like the most difficult types of situations you can possibly think of. So I appreciate uh, getting into some of that stuff. That's that's really tough stuff. I want, um, one thing I was wondering, too, is sometimes, like, have you run across a situation where um, you, you, you bring someone in for some, for, for a conversation because of some conduct or behavior, you have that conversation and during that discussion, and you kind of, I don't know, you kind of open it up to hear their side of things or what's going on for them. And you learn something new that actually changes the whole thing. Like, like, oh, it might actually not be this individual. It might be something else or the person who reported them or something like that. You ever had something like that happen? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The reason why you're talking to employees before you discipline them is to make sure you understand both sides of the story. There's a mindset difference sometimes. Compliance people, compliance HR people tend to see things very black and white. They don't like gray. And if it's a gray, they're going to push it to either the, the, the black or the white. Mm -hmm. Employee relations and you know, HR in general is about gray. You're talking about people. There's two yeah. sides to every story, sometimes three <laughs> when you're talking to two people. Um, and I think the reality is when you see black and white, you need to push it into the gray. And you need to do that to make sure you really are hearing both sides of the story. And sometimes, right, it, it, it's the manager who says, I want the person fired because he told me to go expletive myself. And as the HR guy, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a terminable offense. No doubt about it. That's a summary offense. I need to meet with the employee. And I say, is it true you said that to your boss? And the employee says, yeah, I did, Paul. But it's only because he told me to go expletive myself first. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. No one's getting terminated on that. But I know two people are getting final written warnings. And it's yeah. going to say, you ever do this again, you're fired. Period. End of report. It's a one and done. It's a once in a career benefit that you're not being fired right now. But I'm putting that in paper because if you ever use that to your subordinate or you ever use that to your supervisor or anyone else on the premises of this organization, you will be immediately fired and this document will not be taken out of your file. So if it happens yeah. again in seven and a half years, you'll be fired then. I need to make sure that people understand that stuff. Holding people accountable is career and professional development. It's not the funnest part of career and professional development, but they need to know where their limits are. And you have to get both sides of a story. So yeah, I would say that's yeah. not even all that uncommon, Jeremy, where you get new information and it's like, okay, that's that that moves this whole discussion in a totally different direction. And why didn't the manager tell me that? Yeah, and which uh, makes it which which makes it so important to have to make sure that these kind of conversations, but when you're doing like sort of um, you know behavioral feedback conversations, uh, that it's not just a one way conversation; it's a two way. You're actually opening up for 
for for some feedback. I got okay. I got a challenging one for you before as a last question. I, I think uh, I don't know if we have any more, but uh, last question challenging for you. Okay, okay. Let's say you now as a uh, or or any of us as consultants working. Let's we we come into an organization, and uh, there is no HR. It's a small organization. The president, the one who's in charge, who hired us, says people aren't doing what I want them to do, this and that. And it turns out the president is the one who is using foul language, <laughs> who is doing bad behavior. Uh -huh. And you're talking to people in the organization and they're like, how am I supposed to kind of, you know, so, so, I, so, and, and the president is, is he's, he's, I'm just, I'm thinking of a couple of examples that I've personally worked with is they're not willing to own up to it. They, or they think they're, what they're doing is fine. They don't want to change that kind of stuff. And there's no firing them because that's the price. That's the owner of the company. Yeah. So that, that's actually very common too, isn't it? It's almost like a lot of times CEOs feel like if they're the ones who kick up all the dirt, no one ever has a chance to kick up dirt on them because everyone's always on the defensive. Yeah. Um, so they don't have the time to go on the offensive. Um, it's not, it, it's actually a quasi leadership strategy, unfortunately, in certain CEOs minds. I think that foul language piece of it, Jeremy would be helpful. I think to sit with someone and say, listen, I wouldn't be doing you a service as a client if I didn't go through this with you. And I do want you to check it with your attorney. In mm -hmm. our state, you can be sued for up to $50,000 of your own money. Now, that doesn't include your 401k or your IRA. They do protect those retirement assets. But I'm talking about your brokerage account, your checkbook, your savings account, your home. All yeah. of that could be you know, up for grabs. And you don't want to be on the sharp end of the investigation spear, seeing your name listed, having to defend this stuff in front of a jury of people or whatever, and then finding out that you're on the hook for $75,000 and you didn't see it coming. So I can't, listen, it's your company. I respect that. But I also think that, and then again, in California, I'd say there's no limit in California, especially if you're a CEO, they see you as a high net worth individual. They're going after you and they're going after your company. Yeah, And then what you're doing is you're creating a, a scenario, you're creating a record where by saying these kinds of things in front of multiple people, guess what? The plaintiff attorney is going to say, anyone else ever hear this? Oh, sure. Well, these other only, people heard it too. And, and they're all going to testify against the CEO. I, I've got one who, who writes it in emails, mm -hmm. like writes, you know, the F-bomb in emails. Wow. <laughs> Jeremy, so, lay on the couch. I, I, I'm going to take you through this. <laughs> it's hard. This is yeah. their company. I get it. But you, you, our job is to help them not run it into the ground, despite their yeah. efforts. And I think the truth of the matter is, look, it may be missing awareness. Maybe hearing it from us will help move that energy in a different right. direction. But it's ultimately their call. Yeah. Agreed. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Um, this was this was a great, great presentation. So many good examples for really, really difficult uh, situations. So thank you so much. Appreciate appreciate your uh, your wisdom and your time. Um, we're going to take a let me 